NASA called off Artemis 1 second launch attempt on September 3 after failing to resolve a liquid hydrogen leak during the fueling of the Space Launch System rocket. The leak, much larger than one detected in the first launch attempt on August 29, occurred at a quick disconnect mechanism that connects the core stage of the rocket with a liquid hydrogen line coming from the mobile launch tower. So there was a leak that uh, developed in the liquid uh, hydrogen supply line at 7.15 this morning. The liquid hydrogen team working a, a plan to reseal a leak at an 8-inch QD on the fill side. Because hydrogen molecules are so small, they can fit through even the smallest gaps at extremely low temperatures and high pressures. The quick disconnects that provide fuel to the rocket are designed to detach from the vehicle in the final second of liftoff. Because of this, the quick disconnect mechanism cannot be tightly bolted to the rocket body to prevent hydrogen leaking. As a result, NASA is willing to accept a limited amount of hydrogen leaking. Any concentration of hydrogen below 4% in the purge area near the quick disconnect is not considered a flammability hazard by NASA. But the leak on Saturday exceeded the flammability risk set concentration limit by a factor of 2 or 3. NASA engineers made several attempts to staunch the fuel leak, but none were effective in significantly reducing the leak. According to NASA authorities, one possible source of the leak was an inadvertent overpressurization of the liquid hydrogen line, which might have been caused by human error. On September 6, NASA announced that the agency plans to replace faulty seals on the quick disconnect but did not specify what caused the seals to leak. This operation will be carried out at Kennedy Space Center Pad 39B, where the Artemis 1 stack has been stationed for the past three weeks. NASA claims that performing the work at Pad 39B will enable engineers to test the repair under cryogenic conditions, as well as collect as much data as possible to identify the root cause of the problem. Work platforms have already been installed around the tail service mast umbilical unit, and engineers have begun repairing the seals. Once the seals are replaced and the lines reconnected, NASA will begin preparations for a tanking test, tentatively scheduled for September 17. According to NASA, future propellant loading will be a kinder and gentler process that reduces the pressure and flow change. Aside from the immediate need to repair and test the seals, there are also some other significant issues that may jeopardize NASA's plans to launch Artemis 1 this month. The U.S. Space Force has only certified SLS rockets flight termination system batteries for a 25-day period, which ends on September 19. A flight termination system, or FTS, is designed to destroy the rocket if something goes wrong during the launch. Recertification necessitates testing the FTS batteries, which can only take place inside the vehicle assembly building. A rollout of the rocket to the assembly building for tests will delay the Artemis 1 mission until late October. So, NASA has recently submitted a waiver request to the U.S. Space Force regarding the FTS batteries. If the Space Force extends the FTS certification, NASA will try to launch the Mega Moon rocket on September 23 or 27. If the certification is not extended, NASA will have to return the rocket to the assembly building to test and recertify the batteries. This would push the launch to the next launch window, which opens on October 17 and runs through October 31st. The Indian Space Research Organization has successfully demonstrated an inflatable aerodynamic decelerator, which it said is a game-changer with multiple applications for future missions. The inflatable aerodynamic decelerator is similar to NASA's hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator, an inflatable aeroshell designed to enable atmospheric entry to planetary bodies and the landing of heavy payloads. The key technologies include flexible thermal protection materials for hypersonic entry conditions, attachment and inflation mechanisms, and high-strength lightweight inflatable bladder capable of withstanding high temperatures. ISRO's inflatable aerodynamic decelerator, designed and developed by Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, was test-flown on a Rohini 300 sounding rocket on September 3 from the Thumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Station. The inflatable aeroshell was folded and kept under the rocket's payload bay. At around 84 km altitude, the aerodynamic decelerator was inflated and it descended through the atmosphere with the payload part of the sounding rocket. The decelerator systematically reduced a payload's velocity through aerodynamic drag and followed the predicted trajectory. The inflatable structure is made out of Kevlar fabric, a very strong and heat-resistant synthetic fiber that can withstand atmospheric pressure and temperature changes. According to ISRO, the inflatable aerodynamic decelerator will open a gateway for cost-effective spent stage recovery and for landing heavy payloads on Mars or Venus in the future. Europe's Ariane 5 rocket launched a communications satellite for French operator Eutelsat on September 7. On Wednesday evening, a 55-meter-tall Ariane 5 rocket carrying the 6,400-kilogram Eutelsat Connex satellite lifted off from Europe's spaceport in French Guiana. 
The launch, which was delayed by a day due to severe weather, was the second for Ariane 5 in 2022 and the third for Ariane Space. Just under 29 minutes after liftoff, the rocket's upper stage successfully deployed the satellite into geostationary transfer orbit. The satellite will use its onboard plasma engines to maneuver into its final circular geostationary orbit, more than 36,000 kilometers above the equator. The spacecraft will take many months to reach its final orbit and additional months to complete testing, with entry into commercial service planned in the second half of 2023. The 8.8 meters tall Eutelsat Connect, with an instantaneous rate of 500 gigabits per second, will deliver high-speed internet access throughout Europe, providing a service comparable to fiber-optic networks in terms of performance and cost. The satellite is designed to operate for at least 15 years in Earth orbit. Wednesday's mission was Ariane Space's 37th mission for Eutelsat, extending the two companies' long-standing partnership dating back to 1983. The next Ariane 5 launch is planned for December, with two more in 2023 to close out the Ariane 5 program. In the near future, the Ariane 5 rocket will be replaced by the next-generation Ariane 6 rocket, which European officials claim will be less expensive to operate and more competitive in the global launch market. The first Ariane 6 launch is currently slated to fly no earlier than April 2023. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX continues to work around the clock to prepare Starship 24 and Super Heavy Booster 7 for the orbital flight test. SpaceX tried to conduct a Ship 24 static fire test on August 31, but the plan was aborted after filling the propellant tanks of the ship with cryogenic liquid methane and liquid oxygen. Two days later, a Raptor vacuum engine was removed from Ship 24 and taken back to the build site. It appears that some unknown issues with this engine might have forced SpaceX to abandon the August 31 test. On Saturday, September 3, SpaceX delivered a new vacuum-optimized Raptor engine, with serial number RVAC-115, to the launch site. Hours later, the engine was installed on Ship 24, filling the space left by the removal of the engine on September 2. On Thursday, September 8, SpaceX conducted a six-engine static fire test of Ship 24. SpaceX began the test by pumping liquid oxygen and liquid methane into Ship 24, resulting in a distinct layer of frost around the vehicle. The absence of frost on the ship's methane tank suggests that SpaceX loaded fuel into the methane header tank intended to store propellant for landings. At 4.30 p.m. local time, all six Raptor V2 engines on Ship 24 fired for roughly 8 seconds, delivering approximately 13.8 meganewtons of thrust. The test was one of the longest static fires ever conducted on a Starship. Several thermal protection tiles fell off the ship during the testing, which is usual during static fire tests. The test melted the top layer of concrete beneath suborbital launch pad B, causing superheated debris to travel hundreds of meters away. The debris ignited a grass fire around pad B, closer to the suborbital tank farm. The local fire department could not immediately approach the launch site to put out the fire, since the ship contained flammable propellants. The brush fire gradually spread to several locations, forming walls of flames that sped across the terrain. At around 9 p.m. local time, firefighters were able to approach the launch site and begin controlled burns to clear brush and prevent the fire from spreading to the build site. After several hours of struggle, firefighters were able to totally extinguish the fire by early Friday morning. Fires of this nature are unlikely to cause damage to SpaceX's launch complex, which is surrounded by a solid concrete floor. To prevent fires like this in the future, SpaceX should build an efficient water deluge and flame deflection system at Pad B. On Thursday, before the Ship 24 static fire test, SpaceX conducted a 33-engine spin prime test of Super Heavy Booster 7. A similar test on July 11 ended up in a fiery explosion because some of the methane gas vented through the engines resulted in a buildup of unburned propellant beneath the booster. To avoid such a propellant buildup and explosion in the future, SpaceX now routes methane gas away from the orbital launch mount through new pipes, rather than being vented directly below where it can mix with the oxygen vented from the vehicle. As part of the upcoming International Astronautical Conference, NASA has released a paper regarding the Starship human landing system development. According to the paper, the Raptor engine design has undergone numerous tests, including evaluations of performance under lunar landing throttle profiles. Aft docking mechanism designs which are key to the on-orbit propellant transfer architecture have continued to mature. Moreover, testing and analysis have also been performed for the Starship micro-meteoroid orbital debris and thermal protection tiles, environmental control life support systems, thermal control system, landing software and sensor system, and software architecture. 
The paper concludes that the Starship Human Landing System program continues its hard work toward achieving major milestones. Now, let's discuss further updates from Starbase. Over the past several weeks, SpaceX teams at the build site have been removing thermal protection tiles installed on Starship 26's nose cone section. This has raised questions among Starship fans about whether SpaceX plans to scrap Ship 26. Furthermore, SpaceX has not yet fitted thermal protection system pins in the ring sections of Ship 27. So, it looks like SpaceX has skipped installing tiles on Ship 27. The current theory is that SpaceX will only attempt to recover super heavy boosters during the initial test flights, leaving starships to be destroyed during atmospheric re-entry. SpaceX must design a highly complex catching point to catch starships with the launch tower. And now in the case of the ship, uh, because we need to have heat shield tiles that go more than 180 degrees, a little more than 180 degrees, um, we'll have to have the, uh, the, the catch points kind of like flip out. Oh, cool. Um, but it'll otherwise so be. It stays in the in the lead. It's going to be the lead, lead, lead of the wind. Um, like you either have to. I mean, there's you either have to have a, have a pot with heat shield tiles pop out, or have something that's in the leeward side that that swings out. Yeah. One of the two. Designing such a highly complex catch point takes a lot of time, but SpaceX is eager to launch Starlink V2 satellites on board Starships as soon as possible. So, due to both the enormous complexity and time involved in designing a catching mechanism, it appears that SpaceX is planning to build expendable Starships for initial missions. Once a completely functional Starship catch point has been designed, SpaceX will install heat tiles on Starships to safely return the prototypes to Earth for catching with the tower arms. Orbital launch mount upgrade works are in full swing at the launch site. Teams have recently begun installing the launch mount's water deluge system. A water deluge system is generally used to absorb or deflect extreme heat and acoustic energy generated during a rocket launch. Thousands of liters of water will be poured into the launch mount during a super heavy launch or multi-engine static fire test to protect the vehicle and launch pad from harsh acoustic and thermal environments. According to Elon Musk, an intense effort is underway to ensure that super heavy Raptor engines are effectively confined during anomalies so that a violently failing engine does not damage or destroy the rocket, other engines, or the launch pad. SpaceX conducted structural tests of the Booster 7.1 test tank on September 6. During Tuesday's structural test, the test tank was initially filled with cryogenic liquid nitrogen and then 20 cables running from the cap of the can crusher to the hydraulic rams of the test stand began to squeeze it. The test, which lasted for about seven hours, was carried out to test the latest super heavy design changes by simulating the forces that the vehicle will experience during flight. It was the tank's fourth structural test overall. On Wednesday, teams removed the cable connecting the cap to the test stand, signaling the end of Booster 7.1 tests. On Friday morning, teams removed the cap from the test tank and carried it back to the build site. At the time of making this video, SpaceX is preparing to remove the test tank from the test stand to transport it back to the build site. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.